What's that? Advocating. Oh. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, let's pray together and we'll look together in, in uh, Bible doctrine and soteriology. Dear Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, soteriology, the study of salvation. Are we on? We do this to, for folks watching online. And I'm trying to get a thumbs up here. Are we good? It's Bad? light. Not good? There isn't a light on. Excuse me? There wasn't a light on. We've been having technical difficulties all night long. I'm sorry. Folks. It's blinking now. You're connected. Right. It's blinking. You good? Right, right now it's on. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Now, soteriology, the study of salvation. Now, just to kind of remember, kind of recap before our break, we began this little walk through, and uh, we, we began with the greatness of salvation for our outline, number one, the greatness of salvation. We looked at why we why it's called so great salvation, and we've given some uh, Bible answers for that. And then number two, the basis of salvation, and we've given you some Bible, uh, Bible answers for the basis of our salvation, how is salvation possible. And so that's the, uh, that's the recap. Now, tonight, let's move forward and consider, please, the motive for salvation. Number three, the motive for salvation. So let's follow along in our outline, please. The motive for salvation. The question here tonight is, why does God provide salvation to mankind? Why does God do that? What is the motive for salvation? And there's a threefold answer from the Bible. All right? Bible doctrine, remember, we're going to the Bible to discover what does God teach us about salvation in, in this particular case. What, what, what does God tell us about salvation? And he tells us this, teaches us that the motive of salvation, letter A, is the love of God. The love of God. Why did God save you? Why did God send his son to bleed and to die? On the old rugged cross for our sins. Because he loves you. For God so loved the world. Uh, but God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. Letter B. Not only the love of God is the motive. But letter B. The grace of God is the reason. The motive. The grace of God. And we read of that, of course, in Ephesians 2, verse number 7. Ephesians 2, verse number 7, where the Bible teaches us that in the ages to come, this means after, after this world is, has been judged of its sin, and we're in eternity, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Simply put, friends, if you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior for the ages to come, throughout eternity, you'll be a trophy of God's grace. This is what God's grace accomplishes. It's, a, it's His grace. Kindness. Undeserved kindness. Let us see the motive of salvation, the love of God, the grace of God. Let us see the glory of God. The glory of God. Ephesians 1 verse 12 teaches us that. Ephesians 1 verse 12 the Bible says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. God is worthy of all glory, and he receives the greatest glory by redeeming sinners from everlasting punishment and giving them eternal life. Because Jesus Christ has bled and died for us. He bore our sins on himself, on the tree, and he's risen from the dead. And God is glorified every time. A soul receives Christ to save. It's to the glory of God. So, the love, grace, and glory of God. Number four, the means of salvation. The means of salvation. In other words, the question here to us tonight is how does salvation take place? How does it happen? Think back to when you, you were saved. You know the Lord Jesus is your Savior. You may not remember the exact calendar day. You may, you may not, but you, I believe every person ought to know there's been a time in his life when he trusted Christ to save him. Think back to when the Lord saved you. What happened? 
You know, how did it happen? In my case, I can, te- I can testify that bells, when I'm saying bells did not ring. Lights did not flash. And I really didn't feel funny all over, you know. But that doesn't mean I wasn't saved. Because it wasn't about the, like a euphoric experience. But God did something. Let me give you a few things here according to Scripture. Letter A. How does God save us? What are the means of salvation? Letter A. By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. As he teaches us, of course, in, uh, in the Gospel according to John chapter 1 and verse 13. I'll read you the verse where he tells us, you know, which we're born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of nor excuse me, nor we're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We say salvation is not a man-made work, not a man-made experience. It's not something that man conjures up. But God does it. And the Holy Spirit is active and alive and well, of course, in the work of salvation. He's the means of salvation. The Holy Spirit regenerates the sinner as he trusts Christ as Savior. The Holy Ghost came to live in you well, as you trusted Christ as your Savior. Letter, uh, letter B, also the means, he uses the, the Holy Spirit as a work. And letter B, he uses the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. He uses the Word of God. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 23, the Bible says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, somebody says, we, 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 we want to see people getting saved. How do we do that? Well, we, of course, don't save anybody. But here's what we can do and we ought to do. We ought to be giving out the word of God. Preaching and teaching Christ. Sharing what the Bible teaches and says. And as we tell people what the Lord has already said and told us in His Word, as the Word goes forth, that old gospel message, God works on people's hearts. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. So He uses His Word. He uses, or works in the person of the Holy Spirit, He uses His Word, and then let her see, by grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. The means of salvation, by grace. Through faith. Salvation is never earned by works. It is totally of God's grace. God's grace through faith. And did you notice here as we dealt with this, the means of salvation, we didn't say one word about sacraments. You know, that's a word that Catholic churches throw around a lot, sacraments. And when that word is used, you know when that word is used, People use that word to express an idea. It's an idea that says this is something that conveys grace to somebody. You know, we do this because through this you get grace. You know, so if they say the sacrament of baptism, they mean you baptize and you get grace through that. No, no, we're not saved by works and sacraments and things like that, but by God's grace, and it comes through faith. And when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, because you heard that gospel message. The Holy Spirit regenerates you. You're born again by the power of God. By His good grace, you see. Thank God. Aren't you glad you can do a thing to get saved? Amen. Aren't you glad? Amen. Truth is, you can never do enough to be saved. Neither could I. I could never do enough to pay for my sins. But Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. I owe it all to Him. Jesus gave Himself for me. Now, that being said, so we look at the basis of salvation. That is, it's only possible because of the death and resurrection of Christ. The motive of salvation provided by the love and grace of the Father. And the means of salvation, as the Holy Spirit of God is at work through the Word of God. And we're saved by grace through faith. And then, and then we want to look at this tonight. Letter, or number, number five here. We want to look at the scope of salvation. The scope of salvation. God's wonderful salvation applies to the past, the present, and the future. I want you to know that. The past, present, and future. And so, there's a note here that you have. I want you to see this. It is biblically correct to say, I have been saved. I am 
being saved, and I shall be saved. I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. I'll explain each of those here in more a little more detail with us. All right, letter A. Salvation is a past transaction. Salvation is a past, past transaction. A past transaction. There was a time in my life when the Lord Jesus saved me. Now, in my particular case, I was a 17-year-old boy when the Lord Jesus saved me. And that's been now over 20 years ago. But I, you know, I think back to the past, of course, and I think that I have been saved. That was a, a past transaction. And I want you to note this. We have been already taken care of, already done. It's over, complete, finished, finalized. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin. We have been delivered from the penalty. Have you written that word down, please? The penalty of sin. Salvation is a past transaction, and we have been delivered from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Romans 6.23, right? And we know that Jesus Christ bled and died for our sins, but the wages of sin is death, and Christ died for us. We also understand that when God speaks of death, you know, human beings, we look at things just as far as we can see on the earth, but God sees the whole picture. And when God speaks of death, he doesn't just speak to us about physical death. He also speaks to us about spiritual death, meaning that there is a hell. And people do go to that place that is prepared for the devil and his angels. But people go there because they're lost in their sins. It's eternal torment. And they go to hell forever. And then they're judged at the great white throne. And then death and hell and all those lost souls are cast into the lake of fire. We read by Revelation 20. But the point is, when Christ saves you, you have been totally, completely saved from the penalty of your sin. That death is no longer yours. Christ bore that for you. He paid it. And when he hung on the cross, in those few hours that he hung on the cross, understand please, it was more than just six hours on the cross. In that time, he was bearing the eternal judgment of God for your sins. That's why he cried out and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If he had not been forsaken of God, you and I would be. We would be. And so we have been, by Christ, delivered from the penalty of our sin. That's already done. That's a past transaction. Now, letter B, salvation is a present possession. A present possession. Possession. Present. So letter A is telling us I have been saved. Letter B is where we discover I am being saved. Now let me explain that. Now again, remember, you've already been saved by, from the penalty of sin. But salvation is so much richer, sweeter than just a Stamping a ticket right out of heaven. You understand it is so much deeper than that. Salvation delivers us from the penalty of sin, but now as a present possession, here's what it is. We are being delivered today, right now, you and me, we are being delivered from the power of sin. The power of sin. Do you know what human beings are by nature? We looked at this in our, in our anthropology course. We're sinners. We're bound in sin. We're bound in sin. The Bible even tells us in Romans 3, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none, he said, that doeth good. None. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's what we are as human beings by nature. We are bound in sin. Now, let's be honest. 
as human beings, we love to compare ourselves with, with ourselves, right? We love to compare ourselves with one another. What I mean by that is, it's easy for me to think I'm a good person because I'm not as bad as that guy over there. You know, right? I'm good because I don't do what he did. I'm good because I don't do what my wife did. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not a sinner like that, right? I'm going to pay for that tonight. I can, I can already know it. I'm going to be with people tonight. <laughs> now, the truth is, but we do that. You know, we compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And because I don't do what he or she did, that means I'm a good person. When, when you take God's point of view of it, we look at it from the Word of God, we see there is none righteous. No, not one. By sinner, or we are, by nature, we are sinners. By nature, we desire, we choose, we want sin. We want what we want. And we live in it. That's what sin is, what the flesh desires. But when Christ saves a person, he not only saved that person from the penalty of sin, he not, he's also saving that person from the power of sin. Meaning, meaning, there's now a new nature in you. You are set free to follow God and follow God's will. You and I, by the help of the Holy Spirit, do not have to live in sin's bondage anymore. You and I, by the help of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, we do not have to yield ourselves to sin's temptations, but rather we can yield ourselves to God. Remember when Israel was set free from Egypt and God said over and over again, if you read in Exodus from chapters 4 through, through 12, you'll discover a few times in there that God says, let my people go that they may serve me. That they may serve me. He didn't say just let my people go. He said that they may serve me. You have been set free. You have been saved so that you might serve God, so that you might live for God, so that you might walk in righteousness, so that you might walk in obedience to Christ. How can I do that? Because he, he enables us. We're being saved from the power of sin. Let me show you a wonderful verse. This is not in your notes, but I want you to see this. Would you please go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? This is a precious verse of the Bible. And I want you to see this. It's a precious verse. It, it's a verse that ought to make everyone just shout the victory and give God the glory. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. Look at verse number 9, please. Look at what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 of the New Testament. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now that's still true, right? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now he gives a little list. Look at this, verse 9. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, and of course you know what that means, sexual immorality, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And that expression, of course, has to do with homosexuality and sexual perversion. Verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's, that's that's quite a sobering passage, but he's bearing he's bearing it out. Don't kid yourself, folks. That the you know the, they 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 don't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. There, but this is what their lives are. He says they're not here in the kingdom of God. You say, what hope is there? Then look at verse eleven. Watch the wording very carefully. And such were some of. Not some, not, and he didn't say such are some of you, such were some of you. He said, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. What he's telling us here, listen, God can take the thief, the drunkard, the adulterer, the homosexual, the idolater, the covetous, the extortioner, the child. When that person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and God Almighty saves that individual, not only does he save him from the power of sin, but he sets him free from that old lifestyle too. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not belittling this. Don't misunderstand me. But I saw my wife and my family the other day we were talking about some of these things. 
I really don't, I really, I really don't like so much some of, some of the, the concepts in certain meetings when they teach people to say, and I'm not belittling this, but I'm just trying to make a biblical point. When they teach people to say, uh, my name is so-and-so and I am an alcoholic and it's been so many years since I've drank or something like that. I'll tell you why I, I differ with that. Because I believe this, when Jesus Christ saves you, you are not the same anymore. I was that, but I am not that anymore. Mm -hmm. You see? Christ sets us free. We are being saved. And the reason I can live today in freedom over temptation is by the help of my God, by His Spirit, by His Word. That's salvation. Let us see. Wrap it up, please. Salvation is a future hope. Salvation is a future hope. A future hope. So here we see not only I have been saved, I am being saved, but I will be saved. So in the past, we've been saved from the penalty of sin. In the present, I am being saved from the power of sin. But in the future, I will be saved from the presence of sin. Please drop that word down. The presence of sin. The presence of sin. Aren't you glad that there's a land that is fairer than day? By faith, we can see the fall. And that, that sweet, precious land called heaven. No evil thing, no defiling thing, no sinful thing will enter there. In other words, one glad, some glad that Jesus Christ is not only, not only is he saving me from the hell I deserve, not only is he saving me from the very power of sin in my life, but someday he's going to remove even the very presence of sin. From this world and from us, from you and me, from, from where we should be, we will say to the very presence of sin. I'm glad I'm going, to, I'm going to a land someday where sin won't be welcome there. Mm -hmm. But redeemed, but redeemed, will be. they'll be. Sinners saved by grace will, will be there, thank God. But sin will be gone. The presence of sin forever gone, removed. God's going to do that. I will be saved from the presence of sin. You will be too. As your inheritance in Christ. So, just a word about the scope of our salvation. <clears throat> Next week, by the good grace of God, you'll get into more of this as we deal with words in the Bible like regeneration, justification, things like that. Some precious words that you need to know. All right. Now, let me give a quick announcement, please, and then we'll pray together. A brief announcement. Um, my, next week, we will be having class, of course, as part of our schedule, so you'll be here please at 6.30. But I want you to know, I'm going to be absent next week. I have a substitute coming to go. A dear man in our church family, graduate of Bible College, I know you'll enjoy him. Matter of fact, um, matter of fact, I know you'll enjoy him, so he'll be here in my absence. I hope you'll pray for my wife and I and my family. We're going to be traveling to Tennessee. I have uh, been invited uh, to preach in a chapel service at my alma mater at Crown College of the Bible where I graduated. And I'd ask you to pray for me about that. But in order to get there on Wednesday morning to be there on time, I've got to go there Tuesday. And so if you could pray for me, I sure would appreciate that. And uh, I'll miss you. But we're going to stay on track. We'll be fine. And we're going to be all right. We'll just keep on plowing through. But we'll get everything careful for you so we don't miss a beat. All right? Pray for me. Father, help us in Jesus' name. Amen.